be. Uh, welcome, uh, everyone. And uh, if you've got a Bible, could you please turn with me to uh, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, uh, as we continue our study through uh, this wonderful letter from, Cho- from the Apostle Paul to the church in Ephesus. And uh, in Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to be in verses 17 to uh, 24 uh, this morning, and I'm very excited about the Scripture. I'm very excited um, because these eight verses here in Ephesians 4 uh, finish with a description of how the gospel, which is the good news of Jesus Christ, frames the Christian life and propels Christian living. It's encouraging. It is good. It is, when we get down to it, simple. Paul began in verse 1 of Ephesians 4, the second half of the book, by saying, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Uh, That's what he's building on here, to walk, to live for God, to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, someone who follows after him, to live in light of the calling of God. What does this look like? What is this great and wonderful calling to follow Jesus? And Paul is saying, hey, live not like you used to, but here, now live like this. And he shows what that looks like. That the Christian calling is to be who you are in Christ, new creations with new life, new minds, new identity, and new direction. This is not something that we just simply grab for ourselves. It is given to us. It is grace. It is grace for the people of God. And so, let's read together these words, starting in verse 17. This is the word of the living God. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But this is not the way that you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and retort in him as the truth is in Jesus, To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. The word of the living God. I wish I understood something of this when I was a teenager who came to faith. I wish I understood something of what this text meant before the first decade of being a Christian was over. The gospel encourages us forward. And if you're reading this text and you're hearing this text here, there's lots of words, right? Amen? Okay, I'm just, I'm just like, if you're like, whoa, this is a lot to take in, right? There's lots of words. There's lots of clauses. There's lots going on. Uh, it's easy to get lost when you're reading the Apostle Paul because he's just jamming a lot in there. Amen? If you're not very familiar with Ephesians chapter 4, I don't expect that you read verses 17 to 24 and you're like, oh yeah, I got it. Okay? I'm taking that pressure off your shoulders, but for the next 30 minutes, let's buckle buckle down here. When you break what Paul is saying down, you really start to see the big picture. And what's great here 
is that it's easy to break down in the sense that these eight verses from 17 to 24 are actually, uh, in the original language Paul wrote in Greek, just two sentences. Two big sentences, because Paul was that kind of preacher, right? One sentence, 54 words, and the other sentence, 59 words. They're just two big sentences. And these sentences each have a big point. The first sentence is in verse 17 to 19, and the big point is, this is not who you are. And then in verse 20 to 24, there's another sentence, and it says, be who you are in Christ. Right? This is not who you are, and then be who you are in Christ. And that's the simple big point that he's making, those two big points. This is not who you are. He says, no longer walk as the Gentiles do. And you might go, oh, 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 oh dear. Um, okay, what? Well, there's Jews and there's Gentiles, and those are kind of your options, and I'm not a Jew, so that makes me a Gentile, and, ooh, what? Like, aren't most of the people here in Ephesus, which is, uh, you know, this city, aren't most of them going to be Gentiles as well? Yes. But Paul's contrast is with those who are Gentiles and not in Christ. He's saying, don't live like your people that are not in Christ. The word Gentile means from the nations, right? From the pagan nations apart from Christ. He says, don't live as them. And they live in the futility of their minds. They're darkened in understanding. There's this whole description. The futility of their minds. It's the, the mind of the pagan who rejects the Lord Jesus Christ is one of futility of mind, darkened in understanding. We were created by God as image bearers of God with the purpose of knowing Him and to love Him with our hearts, with our whole body, and with our minds. To have a real, genuine communion with God. That was how Adam and Eve and their offspring were to be created and to live. This is the purpose one of the key purposes that God had for the human race is to know Him and to know Him with our minds. In sin, in rebelling against God, we told one of the saddest verses in all of Scripture in Genesis 3, he said, Adam and Eve hid from God. And we not only hid, they not only hid physically, but we, what we see throughout the scriptures in Romans 1 that we just heard is just such a key text in this regard, is that we use our minds to suppress the truth. And that the life that we construct for ourselves and the worldview that we have and the way that we see reality and everything in creation is ultimately one of futility. No matter how wise we appear to be, no matter how intelligent we are, no, no matter how happy our lives are, there's still this futility. You're never actually going to end in a place of anything other than disappointment. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 says that for since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. That's not saying the cross is stupid, it's saying that the message of Jesus Christ is folly to the futile mind. Alienated from the life of God we're told here in verse 18. Darkened in understanding. No matter how successful people appear to be, no matter how happy people are, alienated from the life of God, those who are set against God and do not acknowledge Him as Creator and as Lord, 
and Savior, no matter how successful one appears, there is no true life in that person. That's a big call to make, but that's what Paul's saying. Alienated from the life of God, and whose fault is that? Is that God's fault? No. And Paul says in Romans 1 that what may be known about God is clear. It says you can look at the creation and you can tell. There's a God, there's a creator who made this. There's science and there's philosophy and there is uh, all sorts of words of God that are spoken loudly in the created order and they all testify to the creator and... No. Due to the hardness of the human heart, that's what Paul's saying here, due to the hardness of heart, we're in ignorance. We're in ignorance about God due to our own hardness of heart. And there is now no neutrality. There's an inescapable binary that Paul lays forth. You're alienated from the life of God or you know him through the Lord Jesus Christ. Those are your options. Those are the options. We follow God, or in Ephesians 2, Paul says, verses 1, he says, you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of the world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work, and the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. Paul is saying that we follow the Lord, or we naturally follow after the prince of the power of the air. We follow after Satan. There's a paras- I use this word a lot. There's a parasitic kingdom of evil And it is possible to follow that by living a life of complete debauchery, but it's also possible to follow that by being well put together, a fine upstanding citizen, but not to acknowledge the Creator and Redeemer. What happens to the good atheist? Well, they go to heaven, obviously. Right? Obviously. But there isn't one. They don't exist. Stop asking stupid questions, right? What happens to the good Christian? Well, they're reconciled with God and they join in the new creation. What, by, by what standard are they good? They are reconciled to God because of the actions of God himself. Paul goes on to say, they have become callous. When we're set against God, we're hardened in heart, and it's become callous. It's it's uh, it's where you just, you're shameless in how you live. That the natural progression of having a futile mind and being set against God and not obeying Him and not seeking to submit to Him. The natural consequence of that is you eventually just become shameless in your sin and you're not actually worrying about what you're doing, that you're living a life of rebellion against your Creator. The mind justifies bad behavior and our habits scrape off all the edges of our conscience which convicts us. And we devote ourselves, we're told, to sensuality, covetousness. To practice, he says in verse 19, to practice every kind of impurity, right? 
When we set ourselves ultimately against God, our flesh, our minds, etc., justify ourselves and excuse everything that we want to do, what our heart wants, we work towards getting. We're like addicts, but we're junkies for sin. And that sin is ultimately about rejecting our Creator and serving ourselves. That's what that is. Lying, stealing, murder, chopping people down at their reputations, uh, committing all forms of sexual immorality that are against God's word, all come out of a heart and a mind that's set against God and seeks to please itself. That's worship. That's what that is. That's worship. It's idolatry. We're setting up the created order in our lives, some things that are created by God, and we're setting them up, sometimes even good things, and we're making idols out of them. We're saying, I will not be satisfied unless I get that thing. I will not be satisfied unless you let me sleep with whoever I want to sleep with. I will not be satisfied unless I have that thing, even if it comes at the expense of my family. G.K. Chesterton, great quote. Any man who knocks on the door of a brother was really looking for God. It is easy, it is easy, people, to find, this is why it's not all just based on externals, it is easy to find a fine, upstanding citizen who doesn't give a lick about God, who doesn't care about honoring the Lord. And they're better than you. Some of my neighbors right now are probably cleaning waterways, right? Because they want to leave a better future for the coming generations. God bless them. But they're alienated from God, and they're not honoring their Creator. And they look much better than some of us on the outside, do they not? You know people. You can think of fine, upstanding person who hates the Lord. This is what Paul says to that. And I'm going to get on to the good news now. And this might be you. This might describe you. Alienated from the life of God. Paul says in Acts 17 on Myers Hill, he says, These times of ignorance God overlooked. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. That's the call that comes with the gospel, to turn from our sins and to trust in this Lord who reconciles us to him and then sets us forth in this new way of living as part of a new creation. He has come to seek and save the lost. Now, all this to say, Paul's saying, that, that description, you feeling uncomfortable yet? That description, Paul's saying, if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, that's not who you are. Amen? Don't live that way. That's not who you are. Okay? Here's the exciting bit. Verses 20 to 24. Be who you are. He said, this is not the way that you learned Christ. Assuming you've heard about him or taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. In Jesus Christ, there is a new way. The Lord Jesus Christ was the one who was sent to reconcile the people to God. The Lord Jesus Christ who took upon himself our flesh. Right? That's what we celebrate around Christmas time, but we should celebrate it more often. He took upon our flesh so that he might bring people to God. He lived the perfect life because, because we failed to do so. He obeyed the law of the Lord perfectly because we break the law of the Lord all the time. Amen? He died in our place because the wrath of God is set against sin, and therefore we deserve the wrath of God. 
And so he bore our punishment. And he rose from the grave showing that this Lord Jesus is Lord and Christ, the one who reconciles the people to God. And he vindic- this, his resurrection was a vindication of what he has done. And he ascends to the right hand of majesty on high, and he sits down as king in his coronation. And Paul's just said here in Ephesians 4, he gives gifts. He has won the decisive battle over all evil, and then he gives gifts to his people, and he sets us free from our slavery against sin. Amen? New hearts, new minds, via his spirit. Okay, everyone accuses me of not talking about the Holy Spirit enough. It's nonsense, right? The Holy Spirit applies the work of Christ. He authors the scriptures. He lifts us up to the Lord. He enlightens our minds so that we might see with the eyes of faith. And we can see what God has done. Paul uses the language of resurrection and ascension in Ephesians 2 verse 6. He says, He has raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. What that means, if you go look, okay, some of you are ardent Republicans, anti-monarchists, anyway. But if you watch that image now in the days to come of Charles seated upon his throne with his slightly ill-fitting crown on his head, and he's seated down there with his scepter and his mace, which is objects of ruling, picture the fact that Christ's coronation is greater, that he has sat down. And when Paul says, he has seated us with him in the heavenly places, in God's eyes, we are seated next to the king at his throne. That's a wonderful picture, is it not? That's a wonderful picture. That is the security of our place and our identity that comes through the gospel. This is found in Christ, as you have learned him. And Paul says, assuming you've heard about him and were taught in him, assuming you've heard about him, the gospel is a message. The good news of what Christ has done is a message to be heralded and proclaimed and therefore received and believed and then lived in light of. In Ephesians 2, verse 17, the Apostle Paul says, And he, and he's speaking about Christ, he says, And Christ came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near, for through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Paul saying, if you're in Christ and you trust in him, you're no longer alienated. You've been brought near. And you've been brought near because the gospel message has been preached and proclaimed to you, and you've heard it, and you've received it. And it is a message that you're no longer alienated and set aside in an object of wrath. You are now brought near, and you have access, access to the king. I didn't get an invite to that thing in London last night, did you? I didn't get an invite. Richie McCaw got one. He deserves it. Okay. But none of us played 148 games for the All Blacks and won two Rugby World Cups. Nor are we dumb enough to try and be Prime Minister. All right. Um, like, you've got to have, like, to get access to the king, you've got to be special, Right? Paul saying, you are special because God has brought you near. He invited you. He doesn't doesn't invite you based on your political leanings or your place as the head of state or your ability to play blindside flanker. He doesn't give you access based on that. He gives you access because he loves you. Away from futility 
And Paul says, if you've been taught Christ, I'm not going to turn this into a 15-minute message. I'm not. Okay, so three, three truths starting in verse 22. If you've been taught Christ, you've been taught now a new way. These three truths that were taught in Christ that show this newness of life. First one. Your first truth that we get taught in this axis is that we are to put off the old self. Put off the old self, uh, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. We put it off. We kill it. That's how you put your old self off. We turn from our sin, we continue turning away from sin, we keep repenting, and we turn away from our old ways of futility in mind and dis- disregarding our Lord, and we turn to Him. You broke up with that person, keep breaking up. That's what Paul's saying. You no longer need to excuse wickedness. Because you're secure. You no longer need to justify your sin and say, well, I felt like it. Or they're doing it too. Though that person that I know is worse. You no longer need to do that. And this is where the language of baptism comes in. It's so wonderful. He says the old self. And then he says the new self. And it's just found in Christ. And when we speak of baptism being a symbol of our union with Christ we see that Paul is saying that something happens in baptism that pictures what happens to our old self. The language is simply stronger than just moving on from our old self. It's actually putting the old self to death. We bury, we bury our old selves, not in the earth, We bury our old selves in the waters of baptism. You have died with Christ, and you now raised in newness of life. Which is why Paul says in Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. We continually turn from and repent from what's happened, but decisively in coming to Christ, our old self has been put away. We've been buried in our baptism. The second truth that we're taught is that we are to be renewed in the spirit of our minds. There's this change here from being futility of mind to finding a mind renewed in God. Alienation from God in our futility, but... Maturity, Paul says in 4.13, he says, Maturity comes when we attain the fullness of the knowledge of the Son. Very simply, Paul's saying, our mind is renewed as we belong to that Son. We know Him. We delight in Him. And Paul's prayer in chapter 3, tells us very clearly how this works. In verses 14 uh, through to 19, he says, but he says that you're being rooted and grounded in love, that Christ may dwell in your inner being. And then verse 19, he says, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. What's going on here? Very simple. What's going on here is this. Our mind is renewed as what God has done for us in Christ. The amount of love, the amount of security that is there for us is applied to us. And it continually washes over us and stirs us up. That's what Paul's saying there in verse 19. The love of Christ, it surpasses knowledge. That's how our inner selves and our minds are renewed. The love of God is not something that we should ever move beyond. You know Him. You know how much He loves you. You know how much security there is in 
him for you. You know that you can go to him. You know you can turn from your sins and confess them and go to him. This is how much, as we reflect upon the love of God, that we find our security and we are renewed. Not only do we put our old self to death, we are to behold and reflect upon the gospel. Renewal is simply the Holy Spirit applying Christ to us day by day, week by week. We say, I know who I am now. I am loved, I am accepted instead of what I once was. But there's one final truth here. This is very exciting. If you put off the old self, you're left with nothing. If you take off your old dirty clothes, you're naked. Amen? You got to put something else on. And he says, put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. It is so easy to mess this up. And to hear these words here in verse 24, to put on the new self created after the likeness of God and true righteousness and, and holiness, and we go, oh, i got to try and become something I'm not. Right? New self, new year, new me. How do I become that person? Not what Paul's saying. Because if you read it and you say, the new self, the new true image of God, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Does that sound like a person you know? <laughs> I'm saying this to make you go, oh, I'm just going to turn into this person on my own here. Knuckle down and read my Bible really, really hard. And pray a lot, and I'll turn into that person. That person is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Not Adam, but the second Adam. And Adam will die and Christ all are made alive. So Paul's not saying, hey, um, follow after what Adam did and uh, get rid of your old self and uh, put some fig leaves on. Cover yourself up. Self-salvation plan. No, he's not saying that at all. The provision of God for the sins of the first Adam is a second Adam who is clothed in righteousness and holiness. A true man, a true human. The Lord Jesus Christ. Not a put-on attempt and a try-harder attempt. I want to say this to you. There are not, you, you've heard it said, right? You've got two wolves inside of you, right? Which wolf grows? The one that you feed with the good stuff of God or the one that you feed with sin? Which, that, the one that you feed is going to be the one that grows bigger? Well-intentioned. Wrong. You choose which one you feed. No, no, no. Something far more decisive has taken place. For those of you who are in Christ, you've been transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. You've been transferred out of Satan's realm and the wolf in the kingdom of darkness has been killed and buried. This is the new man, the man, Jesus Christ. Let him dress you. Let him clothe you. Let his righteousness be given to you. He is the one who has adopted adopted you into the family of God. He is the one who died for your sins, and he is the one who is given you all things of his inheritance. The new self is the one that walks in God's blessing, not lack. The direction of righteousness and holiness that we are then called to live in, when we are called to live in it, comes only because of the righteousness and holiness that is first given to us in Christ. As we lay hold of that Savior, as we trust in that Savior, we are declared righteous and holy, therefore we're able to walk 
as we stumble and fall in righteousness and holiness. To paraphrase Ray Ortland, any obedience not grounded in or motivated by the gospel is unsustainable. Something decisive has taken place. There's a declaration that you are not who you once were, but this is who you are now. The image of God is being restored in you through the gospel and the work of the Spirit. My favorite uh, Michael Horton quote, he says this, Most people think that the goal of religion is to get people to become something they are not. The scriptures call believers to become more and more who they already are in Christ. You already are righteous in God's eyes. You already are holy in that you are set apart and belong to God. Become who you are. Become how God sees you. That's the Christian life, which allows us to say things like this. When we're tempted to sin, it allows us to say, I don't need that. I don't need that. I don't. That's not me. That's not righteousness and holiness. That's not me. And when we do sin, the security of the gospel allows us to say, as we've put on our new self, it allows us to say, I can turn now to my Lord. I can seek his forgiveness. I can boldly go to the throne of grace and be renewed. We repent of the same sins hundreds of times and we're never cast out. Day by day, we're being renewed. Eat of the bread of heaven. Drink of the living water. This is how we put on the new self. We delight in the gospel. So much more I can say, but I'm not. Only in the security of the gospel, are we able to lay off our self-salvation plans, right? To paraphrase Charles Spurgeon, you've heard it said, God helps those who help themselves. But I say to you, God helps those who cannot help themselves. That's why the gospel is so exciting. That's why the Christian life is actually so blessed. It says, I give you everything that you need. That's not who you are. Be who you are in Christ, day by day. And he who began a good work in you shall finish it. I close with the words of John Newton, a man who was brought up in a Christian household and was taught the truth, and he ran from it as a slave, uh, slave shipmaster. And he wrote these words as he came to the true faith. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. That's what Paul's saying. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Our oh, gracious Lord, by your Spirit, Show us the wonders of the gospel. Show us that you are the Lord who forgives all of our sins, past, present, and future, reconciles us to God, to the life of God, that those of us who are in Christ are seated at your right hand in the heavenly places, blessed beyond measure. Help us to be a people of a new creation. Help us to be a people who follow after righteousness and holiness. But let that righteousness and holiness that we chase after be pursued, that we pursue after be grounded in the grace of the gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.